Perfect. Good evening and welcome to tonight's New Hampshire House Progressive Caucus Democratic Candidates Forum for Executive Council District 4. I'm State Representative Chris Schultz from Concord and the House Progressive Caucus Chair. The New Hampshire House Progressive Caucus was founded by New Hampshire State Representative Ellen Reed and other Bernie Sanders supporters almost four years ago in the aftermath of the 2016 election. We want real change and we want to make sure real change happens throughout state government. That means not just for the, not for the privileged few, but for all Granite Staters. And to make sure this real change happens, we, we can't just line up progressives in the House chamber, but we need more progressives in the state Senate. We need a progressive governor in the corner office, and we need progressive executive counselors. So we're very excited to, to host this tonight. Um, this is the third of seven primary forums and we appreciate your patience with us. We've worked out most of the kinks, but we are all volunteers. So um, if we need to account for something as we move forward, we will do that. Um, I would like to thank the director of our forums is Representative Sophia Wazir. Our deputy is Representative Sue Vail. I'd like to thank Representative Nicole Klein-Knight for her graphics abilities. Uh, our timekeeper tonight is State Representative Catherine Rogers, and she has participated in all three forums thus far. And now to our very fantastic moderator, State Representative Marjorie Smith, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee, is a long-term representative from the town of Durham. And with that, I hand it over to you. Oh, and one more point that I forgot to write in the remarks. Please, um, if you want to ask a question, we may have time for it, write it in your chat section. And if you are not the moderator, timekeeper, or candidate, please mute both your camera and your microphone. Now to Representative Smith. Thank you very much, Chris. Before I begin, I want to tell everyone that this is being recorded and you will um, be able to watch it and, and refer it to your friends and colleagues at another occasion. On behalf of the House Progressive Caucus, I'd like to welcome you to a forum on the Democratic candidates for the Executive Council 4th District. Um, a brief reminder about the New Hampshire Executive Council, one of the least understood and most important components of the executive branch of our state government. Even 350 years ago, before New Hampshire existed as a state, there were those who distrusted dictatorial government. The Executive Council has gone through a number of changes since then, but its sole purpose is to limit the powers of the governor, the chief executive, in managing the business of the state. The state's divided into five executive council districts. District four includes Allenstown, Auburn, Barrington, Bedford, Bow, Candia, Chichester, Deerfield, Epsom, Goffstown, Hooksit, uh, Londonderry, Loudoun, Northwood, Nottingham, Pembroke, Pittsfield, and Manchester. I think I skipped one, but I'm not sure. The Executive Council is the watchdog of the state treasury. It approves both the receipt and expenditure of funds, appoints judges, commissioners, board members, and looks after the, ten, the state's 10-year transportation plan. It cannot act without the governor, but it can stop the governor from acting. It votes in public and conducts its business in public, not behind the closed doors of the governor's office. There are three candidates for the Democratic nomination for executive council from the 4th District. Kola Aduwume, Jerome uh, uh, Duval, and Mark McKenzie, of whom Mr. Duval and Mr. McKenzie chose to participate in this forum. We plan to be together for a little over an hour. I'll begin by asking each candidate questions, and each candidate will have up to 90 seconds to respond. Representative Rogers will signal to each candidate as they approach the end of the time. Except for the moderator and the candidates, um, everyone else will be muted. If anyone in the audience has a question, please enter the questions in the chat and I will try to get to as many of them as possible. As we near the end of the session, I will invite each 
of the candidates to take up the two minutes for a closing statement. I plan to alternate the order in which the candidates answer each question. Now for the questions. Starting with Mr. Duval, what do you see as the most important role of the Executive Council? Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, participate tonight. And just briefly, uh, Representative Smith, I know you didn't necessarily want an introduction, but let me start by saying that I had no intention of running for office this year. This came uh, to me uh, a little bit out of the blue. And uh, I'd have to say that uh, I was just not planning to be on the ballot, certainly during these very, very difficult times for so many people. Um, it only came because someone was affected by the current pandemic a bright and brilliant rising star, a uh, dedicated select woman from Gosstown, Kelly Boyer, who had campaigned for a number of months preparing to run, was unable to because she was affected by this disaster, uh, this economic, uh, this uh, health crisis that we're dealing with. And she's fine, she's healthy, but due to uh, unforeseen circumstances, she was not able to continue her candidacy. And that's unfortunate, we lost a good person who would have been on the ballot this year. So I'm humbled to be on the ballot this year. And I think that one of the key reasons why I decided to run was to provide a choice in November and uh, a choice for people who are looking for someone to be their, their advocate. 15 seconds. And I think that one of the roles that an executive council can, can play as a facilitator and an advocate for people. And that's one of the reasons why I'm running. Thank you, Mr. Duvel. And now Mark McKenzie. Um, you'll have to unmute yourself, Mark. Um, and you should kind of probably keep unmuted and tell us what you see as the most important role of the Executive Council. For me, the most important role is to bring uh, accountability and transparency to the process of government. Uh, I don't want anything under the table, behind the scenes, uh, I don't like no bid contracts. I don't like the idea that the governor is giving out uh, thousands of dollars uh, to his friends uh, around this issue of the uh, of the emergency response to the pandemic. Uh, I also think that the executive council has a responsibility to make sure that what the legislature does in terms of the appropriations, in terms of public policy, that that plays itself out in contracts within uh, within the state of New Hampshire. You know, I've spent a lifetime uh, looking at contracts through the, from the eyes of uh, organized labor. I understand contracts. And I also have seen over the period of time uh, some of the things that have happened uh, within the Executive Council in terms of how contracts are handled in general. But accountability and transparency are the cornerstones of this campaign. I think I can ask the questions. I've been doing this a long time in the legislature uh, as a lobbyist, as an executive uh, as having been represent, uh, representative, and also having played a role as the president of the AFL-CIO for a number of years. Thank you uh, very much. The Executive Council's powers to confirm or oppose gubernatorial appointments are crucial to the operation of the state. Um, beginning first with Mr. McKenzie, what are the principles and priorities you will use to guide your decisions on executive nominations presented by the governor? What are some universal criteria you will always be looking for, regardless of the position? What questions will you always ask? Um, what do you see as the potential red flags? Well, for me, uh, the idea, uh, and I've been in public service for a long time, you come to public service understanding that you are an advocate. You are the person who is, is the uh, interface between the public and the government. And so I think anybody who approaches the, uh, you know, the state or is interested in public service, they need to understand that that is the number one role. Secondly, you need to understand that you leave your politics at the door. You are not an advocate. You're not a, a policymaker as the head of a department or as a, as a judge. You simply follow the law and you act impartial no matter what you do. Now, I don't like people who are uh, in a position of advocating uh, positions. Uh, I am not a fan of the, of the current uh, Department of Education. Uh, 
uh, uh, commissioner. I will vote against them if I am on the executive council. And I will go vote against anybody who tries to use that office in that way. I believe that we have a responsibility as public servants to, uh, to make sure that those are the core principles. The other thing I would do is to make sure that people understand clearly uh, what they're getting themselves into and the kinds of challenges they were going to face. And are they able to work with the legislature uh, in making sure that the, the public policy, good public policy comes before the executive council? So that's, those are some of the, the cornerstones of what I believe. And again, you got to make sure that everything you do is right up, right above board and account and easy for people to understand and find. Uh, thank you, Mr. Duval. No, thank you. Um, first and foremost, I think it takes a little bit of humility to serve in any position like this. I, I've, I've got enough experience uh, serving constituents, both as a former school board member years ago when my kids were still in public schools in the city. And then following that as, as, as an alderman in the city of Manchester. And I understand what, it, what it's like to be in the position to advocate for constituent services, to uh, be in the neighborhoods, to understand uh, what the issues are that confront people in a day-to-day -day, uh, fashion. And uh, I'd like the process, at least for me as a counselor, to be one of inclusion. And I think it takes a, uh, a certain temperament uh, and a certain level of a willingness to understand and be able to work with others. But I certainly would like to see an engagement better than we have now from our incumbent counselor who tends to exclude people or look at things strictly uh, through a political lens, who uh, thinks it's okay to serve in the position, the distinguished position of counselor for the fourth district. And uh, anybody who's ever spoken up to him uh, might be fearful of facing his retribution. So I would take the antithesis of that, a viewpoint that is much more pragmatic and much more playing the role of listener. And I consider myself a good listener. I've recognized that I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm a little bit intimidated by the process tonight, frankly. I'm dealing with Representative Smith, who's got years and years of legislative experience and other familiar names to me across the panel tonight. Uh, but I will dedicate myself to reaching out. I will dedicate myself to learning about the issues, to doing my homework, and to make sure that I'm dedicated to properly vet vetting and thoroughly vetting those that come before the council to be appointed to these unbelievably Perfect. responsible and highly elevated positions. It's incumbent upon me to do the work. And uh, uh, you're, I, th I think that uh, Representative Rogers has said your time is up. That's but fine. I'm going to have you begin with the next question, which is, can you give us an example of a recent nomination and explain how you would have voted and why? Well, let me, let me go to the first, well, I guess let me go to the first one. The most obvious to me is, of course, the nomination by Governor Sununu of, of the Attorney General to serve as Chief, Chief Justice. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, relying on people as a sounding board, people that I would trust to serve in an advisory role to my position as an executive counsel would be, would be very important to me. And in the, in, in the instance of A.G. McDonald, it became evident after some scrutiny that that was too much to ask for such an important uh, position in our judicial system. And um, I think that it, it almost borderline on being unfair to the governor to put the counselors in that position. You know, I, I look at the, the, the ratio of women who are justices versus men, and it's astounding. In today's day and age, last count, six of 21 of our Superior Court justices are women. There should, be, there should be many more than that, and I think we have to do a much better job and insist that more women be brought to the process and, and engaged at that level. Uh, one of the five Supreme Court justices, female, not enough. There's just not enough balance in our court system, and I think that the councils can play an integral role in uh, making sure the qualified Time. candidates of the opposite sex are brought forward to be considered. Thank you very much. Mr. McKenzie, um, can you give us an example of a recent nomination and explain how you would have voted and why? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, fall back to the Commissioner of Education. Now, he's not a recent nomination, but he's up again very shortly. The Commissioner of Education, there is not one person in any of these forums that I've gone to that think he's doing a great job. So I think that that's one example of how it is that you get somebody who is an advocate, uh, who is a person who has a personal agenda uh, and is trying to play that out in the case of public policy. So going forward, again, what I would say is that uh, people who have that kind of, um, you know, that kind of mentality, if they approach the work from the perspective that they're going to be the policymakers, that's not somebody that I would support. Now, uh, I, I understand the Chief Justice, that whole debate around there. And of course, I feel uh, very similar to, uh, you know, to, uh, to Jerome. Uh, I, 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 that person was not qualified. Again, there's nobody that I have seen. Uh, attorneys or otherwise that agree that, uh, that he should be in that position. But look, we've got a lot of great people in the state of New Hampshire. A lot of people have spent their lives building and their careers building credibility within the, uh, within the system who uh, would be terrific in, in the courts and be terrific in education and be terrific in other departments within the state. Dean Both seconds. The people we need to seek out. Thank you. Um, Mr. McKenzie, are there any steps that you see as necessary to prepare you in advance of a hearing on the nomination? Well, you know, I think that uh, the idea that you seek public input, uh, you, you know, that if you have good community connections, then you can reach out to people. Uh, and, and I've done a lot of that. I've got a lot of connections with the progressive community. I've been in the progressive community. I led one of the most progressive organizations in the state, the AFL-CIO. And I've been doing this for a long time. I have a lot of connections, not only in Manchester, but around the state. And I think those connections I would use, I would solicit opinions, I would make sure that the people who are interested in those positions, who are interested in a government that serves to them are part of that process. And so I would reach out and do what I can to make sure that people have public input. The other thing I would make sure is that I understand the position, I understand the nature of the position, I understand the challenges of the position, and I would wanna have a pretty clear vetting of what it is that, uh, what these people bring to public service and, and why it is that they wanna be in public service. And those kinds of questions uh, I think are important for any candidate who comes before the executive council. I do my homework, I'd understand who they are. I'd solicit opinions from people. 15 seconds. And I would go forward based on, on that information and based on my personal judgment in terms of uh, who those people are that come before us. Thank you. And Mr. Duval. Well, in these, in these positions that we're speaking of, of course, the, the nominees, the candidates for these positions should certainly expect a full and thorough vetting. Um, I go back to what I alluded to uh, minutes ago when I suggested an advisory panel, and I, I thought about this, and it's a way of including uh, people from all walks of life of various political stripes. And I would plan to put together such a panel of uh, a number of uh, distinguished people who I can rely on, who I can call upon uh, based upon their, their various skill sets and ask them to join me uh, in an open, uh, open way, transparent way to properly vet people for these highly important positions. And I would start with that. As I, as I suggested, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the room and I have no problem uh, seeking out people who are who have a, a different skill set and then have my own to help me make sure that we're making uh, the best and most prudent uh, positions when it comes to these uh, important uh, appointments. I think everyone is entitled to a fair and open process. I believe that the governor, and no matter who the governor is, frankly, uh, is entitled to that courtesy and respect. But I think be prepared to, uh, to experience a very thorough and transparent vetting process. And I think that's what's most important of all. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Duval, understanding that the racial and religious profile of New Hampshire does not offer the degree of variety that exists in many other states, how would you define your responsibility concerning diversity in race, religion, gender, age, or other constitutionally protected factors? Well, first of all, there has to be a personal 
dedication to being aware of the fact that, you know, it's important that uh, those people appointed to positions reflect uh, a population of today's day and age and, and, and a certain, uh, a very, very uh, good awareness of that and an appreciation for that. Uh, I don't think we find that in the current uh, incumbent council that's representing District 4. And that's a chief complaint that I have and one of the reasons why I'm running. Uh, I worked for a large company for a number of years and I'm, I'm reminded of the struggles I had heading up HR for a company out of Hookset. And uh, again, as you pointed out, Representative Smith, uh, we don't have a large population, although it's growing of uh, such a diverse uh, mix of uh, cultural backgrounds. And, but I think it's important that we do what we can in working with unions as an example. You know, uh, I think Mark's experience uh, in that area certainly would be helpful, but to engage the unions so that, so that we make sure that uh, when contracts are up for consideration, that these uh, employers are committed okay. and they have structure in place that will bring along people of various minority backgrounds. And I think that will be vitally important. Thank you. Um, uh, um, Mark. So let me say this. My whole adult life has been devoted to the idea of fairness and equity. I have worked with groups across the spectrum uh, from the immigrant community to, the, to women, to people of color, to poor, to labor unions, uh, to all this diverse group of people. I think I have the broadest background when it comes to having uh, been with them, worked with them, understanding their issues. And uh, that is one thing I'm, I'm proud of. There were many times when I stood shoulder to shoulder with, with many of these people. I was the first one to stand up in a public hearing and testify in favor of gay marriage. I was the one that authored the legislation for fair, fair pay for all people uh, in the state of New Hampshire. And I have the pen that was given to me when the law was signed. I have stood uh, with the immigrant community, went to court with them, stood with them on, on picket lines uh, and, and work with them. I have, I have done this my entire life. And so I think public service should reflect them. I think there is a great number of people uh, in this state who are qualified, who never get considered. And I would reach out, take advantage of the, of the kinds of uh, connections that I have and find seconds. those people that are able and capable and ready to serve uh, in the public. It should be a reflection of our state and of our communities. Thank you. Um, the governor has declared an emergency and is operating under emergency powers as he has defined them. As you have observed state governments since March, are there legislative or constitutional changes that you would propose to ensure that the governor has necessary powers to lead in an emergency without exceeding those necessary powers. Um, Mr. McKenzie. I have been watching this thing for a long time and having done some research with, uh, around the Executive Council, it is, uh, it is really surprising to me that they have pushed this as far as they have. And I think there is a constitutional challenge there, quite frankly, as to what the powers of the governor should be. And the other thing that I'm offended by, quite frankly, having been a legislator, is the idea that they are not included in the process. First of all, that makes no sense politically to ignore the, uh, the body, the Senate and the House and all of those people with all their experience to ignore them in this process. But, but more importantly, you need in a crisis like this, you need the opportunity, you need to bring every resource you can to the table. There is no grandstanding, there's no standing up, there is no defining yourself uh, uh, separate from what the Constitution allows. And the Executive Council plays a critical role in the co-management, the co-executive uh, department, uh, within the Executive Department, they are co-directors. And the idea that you don't include them or that you have all of these contracts that are out there that they never had any, any uh, anything to do with, I think is undermining what the Constitution says, quite frankly. And the whole, you gave a, you gave a pretty good uh, explanation of where the Executive seconds. Council comes from. And the fact is that to me, this, if the founders of, of this Executive Council realized what was going on, I think there'd be an uproar. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Duval. Yeah, there would, there, I, I view this as a serious breach of trust on the part of the governor. When you talk about councils not being involved in a $1.25 billion coronavirus relief aid to New Hampshire is just, it's mind boggling. I don't know how that can happen in the full light of day. And I think the role of the counselor, again, uh, you know, is to go back and to report what is going on in Concord. So I think a, a strong constituent network of getting the message out as to what is going on uh, it is the role of a, of a counselor to some extent. Uh, it's, it's called, uh, it's, it's, this is newsworthy. And for some reason, it seems to be lost in translation. Uh, along the lines of what Mark was referring to, again, I don't know how that type of appropriation of monies can uh, not uh, involve the uh, members from the legislative branch, both the House and, and the Senate. And it seems to me um, something has been terribly uh, lost here. And uh, I think the current sitting councilor should be held accountable for it for not I think uh, making more of an issue of it. And uh, I think that, uh, again, engaging people in the process will be very, very important. And there needs to be better transparency than what we have uh, witnessed in recent months. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm looking at my next question and realizing that I think you've, you've answered it, but I'm still going to repeat it because um, I do think it's important to stress this, recognizing the balance of power between and among the three branches of government, do you believe that the legislature should be involved only to have executive decisions reported to the legislature, or should the legislature play its traditional constitutional role in authorizing the acceptance and expenditure of funds? And I think that's you might have already answered it, Mr. Deval, but do you have anything else to add on that subject? No, I, I think that I think that they should they should uh, uh, participate and play the role to its fullest extent, as uh, detailed plainly in the Constitution. That's what I would add to that. Mr. McKenzie, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I would just say that I can understand your frustration. You haven't been in the legislature for a few years. Um, I think that um, I think that there are three branches of government. They serve us a very specific purpose. Uh, the idea that uh, that we can't work together, that we can't pull the resources that are currently out there, pull them together. When you look at the at the scope and the breadth of the people who are in the state legislature, it's amazing. That's the biggest thing that impressed me when I went in there. It's amazing. There are a bunch of people who could be incredibly helpful. There are doctors and lawyers and teachers and public servants who have been in this business for a long time, reach out for them and, and develop a partnership with them. And that's just, a, that's just a common sense thing. The other thing is that I believe it's incredibly unconstitutional to ignore the executive, the legislative branch and, and poke them in the eye. And I hope that whatever challenge goes forward, uh, I hope we challenge them. I hope we challenge this. And I hope we come to a place where the courts say that you have a role, the legislature has a role, the executive department has a role, but you can't step on each other like that. It's not, it's not good process. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, what, if any, do you see as a justification um, for the governor to issue single source contracts without the usual vetting process. Mr. McKenzie? Uh, you know, if, um, first of all, let me say that I, I, don't, I don't approve no bid contracts. I don't, I, I would never approve. I think it's a, I think it, uh, you know, it bypasses a pro the whole intent of the executive council. Uh, and so I, I, I am opposed to them. So let's start from that point. Are there, are there places or, or things that may happen that need immediate action? Uh, there could be, uh, you know, if all of a sudden a hurricane hit or a flood hit. But let me say that there is an opportunity today with the technology we have, uh, here we are on Zoom, uh, that there's an opportunity to embrace the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the legislature, the Senate, the House, and the executive branch. There are ways to do this, communicate. There should be no reason 
that uh, that we have to get into situations where there are no bid contracts and thousands of dollars being awarded without guidelines by the by the uh, executive council and most importantly by the people who appropriate the money, which is the legislature. Mr. Duval. Yeah. Again, I think I think it's uh, to me it borderlines on an abuse of power when you talk about the the coronavirus virus uh, relief aid to New Hampshire, the billions of dollars and uh, for you know, a failure to, to assume too much responsibility uh, and not engage others in the process, I think is a, is a terrible mistake. And I think it's an injustice to the people of New Hampshire. Um, uh, again, along the lines of what Mark, uh, Mark McKenzie just stated, um, I think that uh, you know, we have a responsibility for an open and transparent government, first and foremost. I think people generally distrust government. This doesn't do that any good. And uh, I think that people are looking to their elected officials uh, for a glimmer of hope that things can be done in an open forum, including people and uh, making sure that uh, it's uh, under the full light of, of day. Um, th thank you. Um, another significant role um, of the executive council is that of approving contracts recommended by the governor for the council's approval, understanding that you will be expected to review long and complex documents. How would you define your role in contract approval and what process would you follow in carrying out that role? Um, Jerome? Well, I'd like to think that I could uh, do half as good a job as former counselor Chris Pappas. I, I know he's uh, a tremendously brilliant uh, young man. Uh, I, I, I know of him to be very thorough, have been very thorough in his uh, performing that type of role at, when he was governor's counselor. And I would hope I could follow in his footsteps to at least a certain degree. Um, it, it can be a complicated process. I have a, a business background. Um, I review contracts on a much smaller scale day to day when I advocate for my clients in the real estate brokerage business, um, fairly comprehensive leases and terms that are, that are in contracts. This is, this is much different. Um, but I can tell you that, uh, again, by involving others and taking the time, providing you have enough notice with the documentation, I think is important. I think insisting as a counselor that the documentation that you need in order to properly vet through these contracts, I think is uh, incredibly important. And I would insist on that as a counselor, I demand it. And, um, and then uh, get into the weeds of these contracts, uh, I think is going to be uh, a, a, a dedication I would have. So but recognizing that it's not necessarily, I can't from day one, uh, be the best at review of contracts, but I certainly will become uh, a good steward uh, and making sure that the details have been uh, okay. attended to, thoroughly reviewed uh, before I decide how I'm going to vote uh, on that contract. Um, thank you very much. Um, now I think I've, I've lost. Mark, you haven't gotten to answer that, have you? I haven't as yet, no. Go to it. Go for okay. it. Okay. So my background is, uh, you know, I've got a, I've got a uh, bachelor's degree in public administration. I have a master's degree in public administration. I have more than 30 years, probably closer to 35 or 40 years, looking at legislation, drafting legislation, uh, looking at the law and what it says. In addition to that, I've negotiated contracts, uh, all kinds of contracts and some of the most difficult labor negotiations uh, uh, we, we have. So I have an understanding of that. But the other thing that's important to me, and I was asked this recently by the Concord Monitor, you know, number one is the appropriation, uh, was the appropriation of the contract, does it follow what the legislature said it should? That'd be the first thing I asked. Are the documents that are for this uh, contract, are they readily available? You know, I've done so much work trying to find stuff. Uh, I wanna make sure that, that everybody has an opportunity to have eyes on that information, even if it's electronically. Because what you find uh, when you have contracts, people start looking at the information. I don't want anything hidden. 
the other thing I want to make sure is that uh, is that is that we have um, we have standards in there that are understandable, uh, so that people know when we start spending money uh, and letting money out what it is that we're trying to accomplish for that. And then let me say the final thing I'd say is I have always been upset by the idea that there are bids and then there are contingencies. And I wanna make sure if there are contingencies, I wanna know how they play against the original bid because I've seen a lot of people lose a lot of bids, especially from the labor side of the, of the aisle who should, have been, who should have got bids only to see their low Fine. bid, the low bid take it and then the contingency comes back and they shoot the bid right past the right past so thank thank you um mr mckenzie um state employees have been working for over a year without a contract um what would you do to um try to move that process along well, first, let me say, uh, I've just received the endorsement of the State Employees Association. And what I told them, and I'll tell anybody, is it is incredibly disrespectful for the governor of the state of New Hampshire to hold negotiations up. The first line in the public employee labor relations law says to promote harmonious relations. When you stretch out negotiations, when you don't uh, come to the table and negotiate and work that out, you undermine, you undermine uh, people, the dignity and respect that they deserve. I would stand shoulder to shoulder with state employees as I have done for, with hundreds and hundreds of employees from all different occupations in the state of New Hampshire and make sure that they are treated with dignity and respect. And the idea that the governor can hold this up and not put this on the agenda or undermine the negotiating process is, a, again, it's a disservice to workers. It undermines, the, uh, undermines what it is that public service is all about. And it's incredibly discouraging for those people who are in this business of public service uh, and just want to go in and do a good job and make sure they receive the kind of dignity and respect they're entitled to. Thank you. Mr. Duval? When the governor, whether it be a Democrat or Republican, uh, uses state employees uh, as a political football, it's time to stand up and hold the governor accountable. And I, I remember years ago, I'm reminded when I was on the school board years ago in Manchester, uh, there was some pretty serious disputes going on between the teachers and, uh, and, and the school district and our city. And uh, I walked the line with teachers on a number of occasions and I took the microphone too uh, in support of a better education throughout our community. And, um, and even at that time, I remember that uh, unfortunately, teachers were used uh, I think unfairly and uh, they weren't treated fairly. And I think that it was a poor reflection in our community. And I remember being very vocal in my position as a school board member uh, to do what I could to promote uh, the cause. And I think uh, here in New Hampshire with our state employees, we have a similar situation where uh, we have a failure to uh, negotiate in good faith um, and uh, honor the commitment we have to state employees, who, by the way, yes. are all, of all various stripes, political stripes. They're just trying to get the job done for residents uh, in our council district, and it's unfair. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Duval, the commissioners um, will have done extensive work leading up to contracts being presented to you for approval. Do you believe that given their familiarity with the issues, they should have the benefit of the doubt and that you should limit your opposition only to those circumstances which seem to be particularly egregious? No, I, I, I think it depends on your perspective of what the role is of executive counselor. Um, I do think that it, it, obviously it has limitations, constitutionally speaking. I get that and I accept that and I'll live by that. But I do think that there's a process of engagement. And I think that, you know, for an executive counselor, a role they can play, again, is serving as that check and balance uh, at the executive branch of government. I think it's a vital role. And I think that you can't be a wallflower 
uh, and uh, assume that what you're being told is absolutely correct or the right way or the only way. I do think that commissioners should be tested and challenged uh, often. I think they should be held accountable. Uh, and I think that it's up to the councils to do their homework to make sure that uh, you're doing everything you can to advocate for the interest of average uh, working men and women of your council district. And I think that's uh, a vital role that they can play. And I think sometimes, sometimes uh, you have to be, uh, have a loud voice uh, uh, supported by facts uh, and stand up and demand uh, greater accountability and more information to make sure that essential services are being delivered uh, and uh, contracts are being honored and fulfilled uh, to the full, fullest extent. Thank you. Um, Mr. McKenzie? Well, here's a, here's a novel idea. How about if the council meets more often? You know, this, the legislature gets $100 a year. The executive council gets over $16,000 a year, and they meet a couple of times a month. So I think there's a little bit of room there to, uh, to get the executive council in more often, because the governor is not going to want to do that. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity to do that. The second thing you do is you pick the right people. You make sure that the people that are in there that you are nominated, <laughs> that you trust them, that you know that they are committed to public service, and that over time you build a relationship with them. Now, having said that, uh, you know I would uh, I would trust the judgment of people, but the the idea is that in the end, as in every job I've ever been in, and the fire service is one of them, uh, having spent 27 years, you know the buck stops somewhere. Uh, if it's my responsibility to make sure that that contract's right, to make sure that it's clear and everybody knows what's going on, to make sure the documents are there. And, uh, and uh, I have to, in the end, if I make a bad decision, I got to take responsibility for that. But I got to be honest with you, uh, I'm going to do the best I can, build the kinds of relationships you have seconds. to, elect the right people, uh, get the right people in positions, and then uh, build that rela relationship and uh, do the best we can to go through all of this work uh, uh, in, in a way that makes sense to people. You just can't Fine. It's responsibility in the end. Thank you. Um, following up, uh, Mr. McKenzie, what are the, some of the things that you would do to ensure that more state contracts are awarded to employers who pay a living wage? Well, uh, you, you know, I could spend uh, three days on this particular issue, I, and it's been something I've been concerned about for a long period of time. I think you have to ask the questions, but more importantly, I think the information that, uh, that is the underpinnings of any contract need to be very clear, that people have, a, have to have access to it. And I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation, quite frankly, to ask people, so what are you paying? And what kind of benefits are you offering? Now, having said that, I think that there is a legislative solution to that. A number of years ago, I worked on a thing called best value contracting. I think it gives an opportunity to bring a lot of these things in, like training, uh, health care, uh, decent wages. And I think it provides an opportunity. But that's a legislative solution. And I would definitely uh, you know, look for that. I think my job is to expose some of those things so that people understand what's going on. And let me say today, Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, put together a package that's going to change the, uh, the lives of many poor people, of many people of color, and he signed a project labor agreement. Those are the kinds of things that we should look at in New Hampshire, where we take public resources and use them to make this state better and invest in our people seconds. within the state. That doesn't happen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Duval. Well, again, just as a reminder, I think that the, uh, the state of New Hampshire should deal fairly with all our state employees and getting and getting those contracts uh, uh, settled, negotiated reasonably and, and, and settled. A living wage uh, obviously is, is a major issue for so many people. Um, to think that we're having to fight tooth and nail to get a, to a $15 uh, hourly wages, uh, minimum wages is, is outrageous in today's day and age. Shame on us, uh, shame on us for not being able to make a greater advancements in that area. Uh, too many people are living below of the poverty line. I, I know what the mayor of Manchester a couple of days ago, Mayor Craig, 60% now uh, students in the Manchester School District are on either free or reduced lunch. That, that number is staggering. Uh, it's, it's, uh, 
it's gotten worse and not gotten better right in our, our hometown of Manchester. Um, wage is obviously a, a, a significant issue and to the extent the councils have authority, uh, constitutionally speaking, um, they should exercise it to the fullest extent by, by making sure that these uh, uh, corporations that are awarded contracts and deliver services in the state of New Hampshire uh, uh, are held uh, accountable and responsible for paying at, at least a decent wage. Uh, and um, I think that the uh, role of counsel can be, uh, uh, can be that voice uh, uh, in state government uh, to bring back to bring back to your constituents in your own district the importance of supporting these causes. Um, thank you. The executive council's role in the state's ten-year plan is significant. How would you define your role if you were an executive counselor in helping to shape a plan that acknowledges our? evolving understanding of climate change, environmental concerns, unintended and intended economic and social discrimination, and the financial responsibilities of the state, all in terms of the state's 10-year plan. Uh, Mr. Duval? First and foremost, it has to be in you to want to fight that fight, to, 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 to identify it as a serious threat to our environment and the economy, frankly. And, uh, you know, for the Council of Gases to stake out his opposition to rail, for instance, time and time again, going back to when he was an alderman and mayor in the city of Manchester, uh, just shows a disrespect or disregard of facts and science uh, and the impact of what um, a number of things have done to our environment over time. And uh, to turn a blind eye to that, to be so reckless, is just unacceptable. And so to elect a counselor, first and foremost, who, who recognizes it uh, in that light, I think is vitally important. And that in itself would be a, in sharp contrast to what we have now for representation at the council uh, seat. So and I think also, again, engaging people who have experience. David Priest comes to mind, former director of Southern New Hampshire Planning, uh, who's a supporter of mine who has endorsed my candidacy. Um, uh, a gentleman of tremendous wealth uh, uh, of knowledge and experience and expertise in planning. Uh, someone who I would certainly invite to be on my advisory panel to help guide me and to help mold policy as to how we can better plan uh, to minimize the, the uh, uh, environmental impact of, um, of uh, transportation, let's say, uh, in the state of New Hampshire, and how we can improve on lives for the next generation uh, by doing that. Thank you. Um, Mr. McKenzie. Well, first of all, I think uh, we missed a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we should have put rail in on the Route 93 route. We spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars building an extra uh, a lane in that uh, in that road. Uh, and we have no, but we're no better off in terms of public transportation. Public transportation is a critical infrastructure in a place like New Hampshire. We need it because most people uh, have to have cars. There is no bus. You can't get from North Conway to Concord to uh, Manchester in any reasonable amount of time and with any kind of uh, uh, money. I mean, you have, it costs you a fortune to do that. So there should be a public transportation system. The other thing, we got to come to grips with the fact that the declining revenues from the gas tax, uh, and especially, I, I don't even know what it looks like now, is not going to meet uh, is not going to meet the the requirements that we need and fund properly to redo our bridges to take care of the roads. Uh, so we got to come up with a plan that really infuses the infrastructure. Now, let me say, and having done that again, it's an opportunity for us to put people to work, to put them in good jobs, to define what apprenticeship programs are and how it is that we can build and expand the base, uh, the workers' base doing things that are important to them and important to our state. Thank you. Um, understanding the complexities of the Executive Council's responsibilities, and we've gone through uh, appointments, we've gone through contracts, we've gone through the 10-year plan, we've gone through the emergency 
uh, situation. Um, understanding the complexities, um, can you suggest procedural changes that in, incorporate resources that should be applied to improve the workings of the Executive Council? Um, Mr. McKenzie. Well, I, I, I say resources. I, I think the Council has to meet more often. The other thing that I've been thinking about is really the idea of, uh, of having briefings, uh, you know, department briefings, so that we understand the council ha has a general understanding of what it is, the challenges that they're going to meet. But also you need to include uh, the legislature in that because the legislature is the one that approves the money. Uh, for many of these things that are ongoing. So, and the other thing, as I said earlier, I think everything that's done in front of the council needs to be up, up front and transparent. Uh, I, you know, I worked with firefighters for a long period of time. They knew everything about that collective bargaining agreement and they had an eye on it. And the reason they did is because it was right in front of them. And I think people, I think if we engage people, that we provide them the information, then they will be the eyes and ears that expand the opportunities and expand the vision, uh, you know, for the executive council and provide serious input into what's going on. But I think the council should meet more often. And uh, I think we have an obligation and responsibility uh, to make sure that we have the kind of information that we need and people see what we're doing. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Duval. We hear lots of talk about the need for improvement in infrastructure uh, in Washington. I think New Hampshire is no different. I'm reminded of a, ter a terrible uh, shortcoming in our own infrastructure and that being technology. I think state government is lagging behind, technologically speaking. We have a platform of some 20 plus years old. It's antiquated. And if we're talking about delivering services uh, for years to come, we need to invest in that kind of inf infrastructure here in our state. And it will have a profound impact in so many things that we do. I'd like to, uh, you know, pick up where Great China with the nominee of two years ago left off. I'm talking about a young man who has built his company in the field of technology uh, and um, would be a, terrible, a terribly important resource to me uh, moving forward to address areas uh, uh, to, to fill that need. Uh, so I think that um, that's one area where we could, where we could uh, stand some significant improvement and investment and uh, it can only help us compete uh, and improve uh, communications between departments, Fifteen make seconds. Much, more, much more efficient as, as a government. Um, thank you. We've had a, a question from um, someone in the audience, and I'm not quite sure how this relates to the Executive Council, but I'm going to pass it on because the core issue was an important issue. We are an aging state. Um, and we see the implications of that in many ways. If elected, how will you work with young leaders in our state? Do you feel that young leaders are getting fair representation? Mr. Duval? Uh, no, no, I, I, think we, I think we have to do a better job and I think it starts with getting young people to trust in government and getting back to a place where government's role is not thought of as something that's evil or bad. And under the current administration that we have, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's gonna leave a terrible uh, legacy, I think, uh, for trusting again in government. Uh, what a terrible example. And if we can restore uh, confidence uh, in, in, um, in, uh, in our elected officials that people can trust that their elected officials are doing things that are um, based on sound ethics, I think we can begin to turn around this notion, this idea that politicians can't be trusted or government can't be trusted. And it's a terrible ill in our society. And I think each of us who decide to serve in any elected position have a heightened responsibility to try to do what we can each and every day to be vigilant in restoring that confidence and trust that young people have in government. At all, at all levels and in their elected officials. And I think that in doing that uh, to, uh, you know, through education, through our schools, uh, to applauding the efforts of, of uh, teachers 
Uh, and starting there, I think, would go a long way uh, in making certain that uh, young people certainly have a, a more thorough understanding of how government works at the state level, the importance of it, and what gov how government can directly affect the lives of so many people. Thank you very much. Mr. McKenzie. Well, I think the, I think the, uh, this is a problem in government in general, I think in the state of New Hampshire is that, you know, to be effective government needs to be a reflection of the community and a reflection of the state and the people who live in that state. And to, and to not have that uh, reflected in the mix in terms of the jobs that are out there, the leadership that is out there, I think is, uh, is problematic. And quite frankly, uh, it's not something that, that uh, it's something that I think needs to be changed and I would work on it and I have worked on it. Now, let me also say that I think as, uh, as somebody who's older, uh, who's been doing this work for a period of time, that I have a responsibility, as do many people, uh, to mentor young people, to include them, to find opportunities for them, to enter into this system and to be part of the uh, part of the government. I I would enjoy uh, more probably than anything being able to to meet with them, to help them, to teach them. Uh, you know, what I've learned over the course of the years and to engage them, quite frankly. And I think that's our responsibility as people who have been in this business for a while, who understand uh, how government works and uh, pass it on, quite frankly, pass it on to young people and welcome them, welcome them into the system. That's what I think one of our roles are as the elders of this, uh, of this group. Well, as, as another elder, I know what you're saying. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. We've been at this for about an hour, and I, I hope that, you know, the, the candidates have had a chance to talk about things that are important to them and that the audience has a chance to, to hear um, what these candidates have to say. Um, I'd like to give each candidate now uh, two minutes to state his case for why he's the best candidate. Um, Mr. McKenzie, you first. I've spent a lifetime in, uh, in the public sector. I've spent a lifetime working in government, not only as an employee, but as an advocate for people. Uh, I understand how government works. And uh, I know what, how important relationships can be in building relationships with, uh, with the elected officials uh, and understand that because that's the only way that things work. It's all about relationships in our, in our state. You know, I, um, I believe that what I bring to this is that kind of experience. But more importantly, what I think I bring is a broad uh, uh, view of, uh, of a number of different issues in the state because of my, the role that I played within the AFL-CIO as an advocate for workers and working families for a number of years. I think I bring that perspective to this uh, that is very different, quite frankly, than some other people who may run for these jobs. Uh, the other thing I would say is, is that I have been a fighter all my life. Um, uh, I understand how, to, how to, uh, to advocate, and I understand that sometimes that's not an easy role to play, that it can be tough. I've had a lot of doors slammed in my face, been kicked out of a lot of meetings over the course of the years. Uh, be assured that I will hold my ground and defend and work for the people of, the, of this district and that they will know that they have an advocate there that's working, that's on their side, that is fighting for them. And I will not back down, sit down or shut up as long as I'm fighting for the right things for the people that I represent. I want this, I want the support. I'm asking for the support of, for this position. And I promise you that I will do the best that I can to represent the members of the district, fourth district. Thank you very much. And Mr. Duval. You know, during these challenging times, I can't help myself from be, becoming in, introspective. And I want to share my story with you. Um, I wasn't supposed to be here. It was supposed to be Kelly Boyer. And through no fault of her own, after months and months of investment, preparing herself to be on the ballot, to meet with voters, and to ask for their vote, she wasn't able to through no fault of her own, through this pandemic that has just consumed so many people and kind of set us back on our heels a bit. So I'm humbled and I'm grateful to be in the position I am and I'll do the best job I can as executive counselor. But if you want a counselor to be a lightning rod in all matters, I might not be the guy for you. First and foremost, I want to be viewed as a good listener. 
I think too often today people feel their voice isn't heard. When I attended a Black Lives Matter vigil at Stark Park, I was struck by how quiet it was amongst the overwhelming uh, crowd. You could hear the rustling leaves, and as each person shared their stories, at that moment I was forced to do one thing, just listen. And honestly, to expose myself a little bit, I broke into tears. In me, as evidenced by my long career as a small business owner and a real estate broker, you get integrity and an eternal vigilance to sound ethics. But don't take it from me alone. Ask anyone I've done business with or a client I've advocated for. My moral compass is always pointed in the right direction, especially on decisions that impact the lives of others. Ask the countless people who are on their own have come forward to give their testimony in support of my candidacy. Gray Chinawith, who was the nominee for the seat two years ago, is one of my most enthusiastic exactly. supporters. Former State Senator and Commissioner Bob Bossie is with me. Manchester lawyer, a longtime friend, Maureen Manning. Go to them, ask them what they think of Jerome Duval, and ask them if they feel that I'm suitable for this position. And you decide on your own what you think is best and who you ought to vote for. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with each of you tonight. It's been a tremendous honor and I hope I can do uh, the position uh, just. Thank you very much, Mr. Duval and Mr. Um, McKenzie. Uh, thank you for being willing to participate in this forum. Thank you to the audience for attending and for questions and to the House Progressive Caucus for making this forum possible. I also want to thank the timekeeper, Representative Rogers. I always feel better when I know that Representative Rogers is on my team. Um, to uh, people who are watching this live or who will see it when it is um, available on what I'll say tape, I know it's not tape, but I don't know what to call it. Uh, please consider taking advantage of the opportunity to vote by absentee ballot in the primary and the general election. If you have not yet received an application to apply for absentee ballots, you may go to the Secretary of State's website or contact your own town or city clerk. You'll get an application uh, to apply, fill that out. You will then receive the ballot for the primary, which is September 8th. Fill that out as soon as you get it, and you can either mail it back to your city or town clerk, or you can drop it off at your clerk's office. But don't put that off unless we have every possible voter participating. We're not doing justice to our obligation to a democratic society. So thank you very much. And I believe that uh, Chris Schultz would just like to have a closing message. Thank you so much, Representative Smith. You are a fantastic moderator, as I knew you would be. Thank you to the candidates. And thank you to our timekeeper and everybody who attended this today. Know that we have four more forums to go. Our next one is this Wednesday, August 19th for State Senate District 15. I believe that's the seat to replace the seat currently held by Dan Feltis. I might be wrong on that, although that is going to be one of our forums. Um, also next week is Democratic Convention. So thank you so much and uh, look for the next forums on all the ways you found us here today. Take care, everybody. I know. Mm -hmm.